Hey everybody, this is Dan with Pain Free You. And today I have the absolute pleasure of introducing Ingrid from Scotland. Uh, Ingrid is one of my coaching clients in the group and she wants to share her success story today. She's had a long journey. And instead of me telling the story, I'm gonna let her kind of give you guys a, a rundown of where she's been, where she is now, and you know, a bunch of stuff in, in between. So Ingrid, thank you. I appreciate you doing this. You're going to inspire a lot of people. And I also know that a number of people within the group are like, when's Ingrid's success story coming out? So they want to hear from you as well. So welcome. Thank you. And uh, tell us a little story. Hi. Wait, okay. Um, <laughs> I actually come from originally um, a group of islands called the Orkney Islands, uh, and that will become relevant. So you've got Scotland, you've got England, you've got Scotland, then you've got the Orkney Islands, and you've got the Shetland Islands. So I'm from Orkney originally, um, an area where there are more sheep than there are people. So everyone knows everyone. Um, a sneeze at one side of the town is like influence at the other side of the town. You get kind of get the gist. So um, that's where I came from. Um, I came from a very close family, um, my mum, my dad and my sister. Um, sadly, when mum was carrying me, or oh, just be yeah, when mum was carrying me, she was also nursing her own mum through um, cancer and um, wouldn't put her into hospital. And, and basically my own, my granny died after not long after I was born. And prior to that, um, I would have had a sister called Alison, um, who would have been two years older than me, um, but she died too uh, when she was one year old. So my poor mum, when she was carrying me, had a lot of lifey life was happening to my mum. Um, and added into the mix, my father growing up um, had, um, well, I would now, knowing what I know, say TMS, but he was diagnosed with severe depression. Um, and it, he basically did the roller coaster uh, ride. But we grew up with dad being labeled as someone with depression. Um, and when he was really bad, he would be taken away from the Orkney Islands and put down to where we now live, actually, in Aberdeen, um, to hospital for electric shock therapy, hugely taxing drug regimes. Um, and so growing up, we had periods where my dad just you know all I can remember growing up are the good things my father was life and soul of the party and you know an elder of the church and you know a real um social person um so some say I take my personality from my father um so uh you know very outgoing very gregarious but when he had depression and that he was the entire opposite um and Orkney being Orkney and everybody knowing everyone and the stigma that surrounded depression um you know, he was kind of branded a bit of a going off to the nut house, is what they said, which was basically the, the um, psychiatric hospital down here. So that was kind of my growing up um, kind of influences, if you like, or the, the environment in which I grew up. Because what I find um, in some of the work that I did before I met you, Dan, there was a great deal of going back. Um, and I don't, I've tried the journaling and everything, but I never did very well with going right, right back, but I do have, I can join the dots. Um, so a key happening in my late te mid teens was um, I was out with friends and hadn't intended to, to do what happened. Um, we were at a dance and this was the Miss Orkney dance, but I, you know, ladies had come, young ladies had come along dressed up already, you know, head to toe. They were the beauty queens, they were gonna do it. So. The judges had come and chosen us off the dance floor and, you know, tapped me in the shoulder and said, when I come? And I'm like, no, not a chance. Um, but my friends were like, Ingrid, go, go. You've got to go. And I'm like, oh, I'll go for a laugh. I won. Um, and so, but there was audible, oh, I can't believe she's actually won this. Um, you know, she doesn't deserve it. Um, look at the, the girl that came second was stunning. Um, and that began this undercurrent in my life that I'm not good enough. I'm not enough, pretty enough. I'm not worthy enough. And that ran and has been a constant throughout my whole life. Um, so the day after I won the competition, I faked an appendicitis. So I'd end up in hospital so that I wouldn't go to my Saturday job because everybody would see me. 
I stopped going to school um, and I was a straight A student and I was destined to, you know, be, go to university and everything. And um, I really didn't give a shit what people thought about me before this happened. But after it happened, I was just petrified. You know, my whole life became about, you know, looking perfect and people liking me, people kind of, you know, I, I couldn't exist or be in a com comfortable in a, an environment unless, you know, I, I was able to be liked. And if I couldn't be liked for how I looked or how I was, then I would people please to the nth degree. Um, so when I, I went off to university, um, I, like, I didn't finish school. Um, so I didn't finish with the qualifications that, you know, I was you know, destined to have if I'd stuck the course. Um, and so very quickly I came um, back to Orkney because I couldn't, everything I tried, I just wasn't able to kind of keep going with because the whole thought processes that were going on um, and, and fear, which we all know is not a good you know, it's a bit destructive to say the very least. So I came back, got married um, to someone um, and uh, they basically wanted me to be like a supermodel on their arm. Um, and I cut myself off from my friends, cut myself off from my family. I fell pregnant and um, my ex-husband made me choose between him and the baby. Um, and I went and I chose him. Um, so... I um, ended up having to come away from the Orkney Islands to no longer have that baby. Um, I'm not going to use the word because I don't agree with it. But at that time, I, you know, my husband, my husband was saying like me or the, the baby. I had to come away myself. I wasn't allowed to tell a single soul um, across the whole of the islands. Um, and my husband didn't even come with me. Um, so I ended up collapsing in the hospital um and I pleaded with my husband to come and he came and visited me and he presented me with um a box of lingerie um as a present after I've just right. had to get rid of our child so needless to say that was the man he was very abusive in that so I um that marriage didn't last he he actually also was having an affair so he you know that happened mm -hmm. but that again it was just this layered effect of you know what I've been how I was brought up um what happened to me and then you know so it all built up this very low self-esteem um and so that continued and, and there was many instances um you know I, I would I got married I got divorced I went away from the Orkney Islands it didn't work out um, and there were things in my life then, there were like frequent um, skin disorders, um, IBS type symptoms. And every time I would never see the link. But now looking back, I can definitely see the link between those life circumstances and, you know, basically the TMS. So I was, I was continually trying to be somebody I just could not be. And I was suppressing all these, um, you know, emotions and situations and um uh, but then I met and I also developed anorexia and bulimia, which was a constant from the, about the age of 16 to the age of 25. And I met Nigel, um, my husband, um, and moved in with Nigel and uh, was still bulimic. And I remember he'd lived on his own for a while and he, um, sorry, one of my dogs is scratching at the door. Um, he, yeah, I couldn't hear it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> he... I had a bulimic episode and after the bulimia I would replace what, what I'd binged on so he'd been at work um he'd encouraged me to go back to uni so I was at uni so he was a full um he was working and I was uh, studying and so um he'd come home and I'd replaced everything and he came into the house and I could hear him searching through cupboards and everything and I, I remember him distinctly he came in, into the, the living room and he basically said what the f is going on and I'm like, what do you mean? He says, the bread, the jam, what's going on? You know, um, he says, I've been downstairs. There's tons of wrappers in the, in, uh, in the, in the dustbin. And I said, nothing. Um, and then I tried to get out of the house to basically kind of, and he said, no, he says, you're going to sit down and tell me. And it's the first time I'd ever really told, because I didn't really share with anybody growing up. Right. And to this day, I mean, my parents have passed away, to this day, nobody in the Orkney Islands 
of both sides of the family knew what happened to me when my ex-husband made me choose the child. So talk about suppression. I Not a single soul knows. Um, and my mum, bless her, uh, I she burnt all my wedding photos. She, she, I can't even remember, you know, much of my first wedding. Um, but uh, anyway, so Nigel got me to the doctor and went to the um, the doctor and spelt all this out. And he said, you're depressed. You have genetic depression like your father. So your father had this severe bouts of depression. You have not you've had symptoms of depression. So everything that happened, he said, all linked to depression. And of course, my um, understanding of depression was what my father had growing up. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't it wasn't a good um, diagnosis for me, but at least I had a reason. So I thought, aha, you know, this explains what's happened to date. So we're going to put you on antidepressants and chances are you'll be on antidepressants for the rest of your life, but it'll stop you being like your dad. So, yeah, so I, I we got married and had kids and everything. So I trundled away, but I never really addressed um, anything that happened. I would say, oh, it's because of my depression. Anything either physical or mental, um, then, you know, that includes things that can happen with TMS, as I said before, skin disorders, IBS. Um, I just put down to, okay, that's just depression. Went to the doctor, doctor up the antidepressants. Um, so I went up and down, up and down antidepressants based on what I was, what, how I was, you know, medically getting on. Um, so when the kids were like two and four, I, um, so I, I did my degree, graduated, got married and fell pregnant with um, Samantha, um, all within uh, my 30s. So I kind of, you know, I hit 30 year old. That all happened in one year. Um, and uh, so, I, and then I had, um, unfortunately, I miscarried between Samantha and Kaylee. And they'd said to me about getting off antidepressants before I became pregnant, but I became pregnant really quickly. Um, so there was that kind of, um, Samantha was born. What what it is now? No, I now know is she was born too quickly because they had to induce me. I had something. Would you believe they called irritable uterus? And it's like there's no such thing. But I kept getting like symptoms of um, going into to labour, um, and uh, so she actually I was taken in because I had this kind of she was she two and a half weeks early and. Um, she was born too quickly because after 36 hours of being you know, induced and trying to have her quickly, uh, have her, I was like, when she started to come, the midwife was like, Ingrid, slow down. I'm like, eh, not a chance, this child's coming. So the midwife, she was born when the midwife only had one glove on. But she remained really jittery in the hospital and everything. It was in the neonatal unit. And they said, I thought in my head it was because I had still, you know, I had her when I was still on antidepressants. But I never, ever saw any link to... Um, you know, I never questioned, ever questioned the depression. It was always the depression was there and everything. Um, and there was always that undercurrent of, you know, I'll do whatever they say because, you know, they're, they're, they know best. And um, so, and because I still had this, you know, everything for me had to be perfect. So from that age of winning that beauty competition, every part of my life had to be perfect. Um, I can just call a look at myself now, I'm bright red. <laughs> And I'll say to people that are listening, since I joined Dan's calls, every time I spoke on the call, I would go bright red. I've done that for months when I've been speaking. Now, I'm, now, now I think it's obviously the emotion coming out. Um, okay. So, yeah, so I went back to work after I'd had um, I, my second daughter, but I actually miscarried twins in between um, Samantha and Kaylee. So um, there's a lot I went through that I never really dealt with um, and went back to work um part-time but tried to do be the best I was a consultant and a marketing consultant and you know I was basically doing a um full-time hours and part a full-time job and part-time hours as a consultant and I ended up with a urine infection that went into my kidneys um and I ended up you know a lot of pain um and was taken into hospital and uh that was my first diagnosis of what they call interstitial cystitis or irritable bladder or painful bladder syndrome. Um, and again, I had another label. So now I had depression and I have this interstitial cystitis. 
Um, but I know it was CMS. I was doing far too much. I was never dealing with my, you know, mental, emotional side of, you know, not being good enough. And I've got to do, you know, I can't possibly not well going back to work. I've got to be the perfect mom. I've got to be the perfect consultant. I've got to be the perfect wife. Um, so I got better from that. But I actually did get um, investigations done. And they, they said that, which I think would be, as you would call it now, a normal abnormality. They found some problems in the ladder of um, the lining of my bladder. But looking back, they could have just been sitting there. Um, but, you know, that was like, that's the definitive proof that you've got IC. Um, so but I got better at that. Um, and just continued. So our married life, we went from into being expats. So we went from country to country to country. So we went and we lived in Beijing. We lived in um, Vietnam. We lived in Indonesia and we lived in uh, Trinidad. And then I came back to live in the house we're in now. Um, we took it back after we rented. And throughout that time, um, I was hospitalized in Beijing um, with, again, what I thought was interstitial status. But each each new posting that we went to was difficult because you were re-establishing yourself. So all those insecurities and all that you know, perfectionism and all that people pleasing, it all was renewed each time. So each time I was in all those postings, I have instances of um, interstitial cystitis. Um, but it wasn't, it was TMS. It was all that pressure of trying to be perfect, trying to be light, trying to people please, trying to, That's so, you know, and if I went, when I went to a country, I couldn't just go there and enjoy it. I had to, like when the kids were little, I was PTA president in the, this, this school in Beijing with 1,200 students and, and a committee of 18 women. You know, trying to get a committee of 18, you know, women that are all, a lot of the time when you're an expat, you you have your own career, you have, and, and, but you, you can't work because of work permits and everything. So I had these really intelligent women trying to get them to all to agree on things in a PTA, you know, setting. You know, we did a big spring fair, we did massive events and that. So I put so much pressure on myself each time I went to a new posting that each country that I've been in, you know, it was a catalogue of, you know, a little bit of... um I see or a bit of IBS or a bit of skin disorder so that but sometimes it was so bad I would end up in hospital um, and they didn't know what to do with me and each time it was just a case of up the antidepressants fill her full of you know um, you know drugs and that sort of thing you would get better and then it would go away and then you'd go into the next post you know it was just, so it's just like this for years and years so when I came back um, and started living here um I had a, a a really bad bout of um, IC, which I now know is TMS. So this would have been, what, three years ago? No, two years ago. And um, I was taken into hospital and had a cystoscopy. And the prior to that, I had the IC hit. I had a really bad bout of, of depression. And... I was in chronic pain. I mean, I can't explain the pain, plus the mental agony of, we were in COVID at the time, so we were in lockdown. The girls had left home. We were back living in a tiny village um, and there was no means by which my coping mechanism, which was, you know, being a people pleaser, doing a perfection, doing something, you know, doing a big event or proving myself. Um, you know, I'm just in a house, I'm, I'm a housewife, Everybody around about is, there's nothing for me to prove myself mm. with. So I was lost. This was my coping mechanism throughout my whole life. And I was completely lost. So um, it's no wonder that, you know, my body finally kind of just went enough. Um, so that would have been March of last year. Um, and I ended up in a heap on the floor, pleading with my husband just to let me kill myself, basically. I can't explain, and I don't want to go into great depth of how bad it was, because I don't want that to trigger anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the worst it had ever been. Um, and at the time, our resources here in, in the UK were stretched to the limit with COVID. So the psychiatrist said, 
literally put me on the biggest gamut of medication. They were trying whatever they could. So I was on uh, antidepressants, but then I was put on tranquilizers. I was put on painkillers. I was put on um, nerve tablets. So, so I was on this cocktail of drugs that weren't even touching the pain. And I was a zombie on top of it. Um, and I remember thinking that the, the psychiatrist has said that I should basically be in a psychiatric hospital, but Nigel offered, not offered, Nigel said he would support me. So I I, ended, I, I stayed at home, thank God. Um, and, you know, basically had these weekly appointments with a psychiatrist um, and nothing was getting better. And they just kept putting more drugs in me. Um, and I started to think there must be more to this. Um, I can't, I think they're trying to up more of the medication. I just said, I'm not going to be able to function. I, I am a zombie. So I started to do a bit of Dr. Google, but in a good way, just looking at the mind body. Um, uh, what's the word? Yeah, just the mind body medicine, if you like. Um, but I applied my usual perfectionism and, you know, I, this became my job was to, you know, to, to, to research it. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I bought Nicole Sachs's course, um, did the journaling. I, I bought, there's a whole library of books up there. Um, and I basically made it my full-time job to get better, mm -hmm. um, which only put even more pressure on me. Um, and I was still on the drugs. Um, and I stumbled across um, Dan Buglio um, and yeah. Pain Free You. <laughs> I've never heard of him. <laughs> and um, it was I had gone on to Curable, I, you know, and I had listened to six I mean, I from the minute I woke up until the minute I would go to bed at night, I was listening to podcasts. I was journaling. I was trying to find out something new. Um, and, you know, I was tapping um, the EFT tapping. I was seeing um, therapists um, and, you know, it was it was just more and more and more pressure. And I just thought, what, well, what more can I do? You know, I can't take more drugs. I can't research anymore. Um, it's not working. And it was just one of those kind of like fate or whatever you want to call it, but, you know, came across yourself and, and also came across TMS, about, you know, the, the terminology TMS, TMS at the same time. Um, and I thought, hmm, this kind of makes sense. This this could possibly kind of be the, the, the it can't hurt. Right. It's just, so uh, I then, in that same kind of process, found Dr. Sarno. So I bought the mind body medicine because I didn't have back prescription. Mind, yeah, body yeah, prescription. mind body prescription. Yeah, sorry, mind body. Yeah, I just want to make sure for anybody listening. Yeah, no problem. Um, and so I read that from cover to cover in a short space of time, and I saw myself on every single page, and I'm like, "Holy shit!" Or as I would say, "Holy crap!" This makes sense. This is me. Um, so I thought, right, okay, so the whole how to get better from it was two or three pages at the end of the book. And I thought it's but, all about what's going on, but this much about how to how to yeah. do it. That was my that, story. that's why it took me so damn long. Yeah, and I'm thinking, I can't be right. You know, I've spent thousands of pounds and there's all this gamut of stuff that I'm doing, but this guy's saying it's that's all that's required, you know, to get better. And it took my brain took a lot of convincing to to get to the point whereby, but that's it. This is this is all that's going on. All that you have can be explained by TMS. Mm -hmm. But my medicalized brain from the age of well, 25 when I was diagnosed with depression to, you know, 50, what would I be? I'm 56 now. So am I 56? What age are you, Dan? I'm 57 years old. I'm I was born, I was born in 65. Yeah, so I'm the same age as you. So I was 56 when I discovered TMS. Um, or, you know, stumbled across TMS. So how could that possibly be all those years of you know depression and everything that goes with it, interstitial cystitis? Um, you know, it, it it can't be. This can't be as simple as this. It just can't. So I was still under the care and still seeing the psychiatrist, and the pain was still there. And it's almost as if I read that, then I read. I, I got so jealous of people that get book cures because I read it. My mind went to, yes, this is it. My pain got worse. And I'm like, 
have people read these books and get better why am i reading this book and then there's this bit that makes sense and the, you know it's the it's the key for mm. me yeah i'm worse so i just thought no nope, i'm going to persevere um but the i was offered a cystoscopy again and i thought oh, well what have i got to lose i'll go in um and uh because they'll find that there's something wrong with the bladder again that'll just confirm I've got interstitial cystitis. So I'm, I've got TMS, but I've also got interstitial cystitis and I've also got depression. So that's what's going on with me. Um, went in, got the uh, the cystoscopy. And I remember I had a senior um, a professor that was the guy that was my consultant. And I distinctly remember he, he could have written, you know, he could have recorded, you know, uh, apps for relaxation. He was a the soothing voice and he kind of I remember him saying to me when I came round, Mrs Baker I am delighted to tell you you have a pristine bladder there's not a thing wrong with you oh. he says in fact I'd like your pictures to be in a book and I'm like no um and then he kind of showed me the photographs and I still actually can visualize the photographs um and he says I've never seen such a you know a, a healthy bladder there is absolutely no way you have interstitial cystitis. He says, you are, there's nothing wrong with you. And I burst into tears, not happy tears, tears like, you're wrong. How can this be? You know, this does not match how much pain I'm in. Sure. Um, and he's like, no. And, but the pain, you know, I, I, the next day after that, because you've got anesthetic and everything, I had a day where I was pain free. And I thought, yes, this is it. Easy, you know, I've been cured. My brain's finally got it. A little did I know it was just because I had, you know, the leftover um, anaesthetic. The following day after that, oh my God, the pain was like through the roof. And I thought, but there's nothing wrong with me. And so this must be my brain playing tricks. Well, not playing tricks, but, you know, it's the fear. So mm. I'd hope that this answer to, um, would come back that I had something that would make sense to my brain and that that would then mean that yes I, I've got interstitial cystitis and I've got TMS but it didn't it you know all I had was TMS so I then um joined your read about you or heard about you started listening to your daily videos mm -hmm. um but I never I still kept the other things going as well so I had that kind of portion but you came alongside Nicole came alongside um you know the TMS wiki came alongside uh, I, I can't remember the, the other various terminologies that I had. Um, and it's only through listening to you and realising that I had to swim towards just the one basket. I had to let these other things go. Um, and the more that I did that, I kind of you know weaned myself off all the different processes. Um, mm -hmm. I started to see progress. I started to have pain-free tiny moments. Um, and then I joined the, the group calls and that was the beginning of me finding my home. Um, and I think asking myself, you know, the way that you teach the, the emotional side of us. And I th thought I've had so much that I've repressed over so many years. I don't actually need to go back to those things because the things I told you earlier were that, that happened to me over my life are you know upsetting sure. and those are just other things that have had the, 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 those key moments there's been a lot of other lifey things that have happened going back and journaling about them all that did was make bring it all back so it you know I found that that once I started to actually just allow myself to feel those emotions you know not revisit them as such but just basically recognize that they're they've been part of forming who I am Mm -hmm. and let, letting them go that was key and the feeling your right now stuff right yeah and i do sometimes write down i did sometimes write down right now stuff and that did help sure. but i didn't I, I threw away those make your lists and spend 20 minutes kind of you know journaling about the fact that i you know have a baby that i never was going to meet and you know my husband had an affair and, and you know that made, that just made me feel like crap and then after that, you do 10 minutes of self-love. Um, and I'm like, 20 minutes of feeling like absolute shit. And then I'm 10 minutes of there, there, there. And on you go with your day. Mm, didn't work for me. Yeah, it's like, here, um, let me beat myself in the face and then get a Band-Aid. Yeah. And do it um, tomorrow. And then get a Band-Aid. Like yeah, just... on a daily basis. Yeah. 
until you get better. And if you're not yeah. getting better, you need to beat yourself in the face harder and yeah. go darker and deeper. Yeah. So yeah. Um, as you know, I don't really uh, believe digging up old traumas is the way to teach our brain now that we're safe. No. And no disrespect to all those people for whom it helps. Um, it, you know, this is my success story yeah. and my success story is that that didn't work for me. Um, so I'm not dissing anybody in this process, but that didn't there work for me. There are people that do get better from those processes. Um, but there's plenty of people that I've come across that are thrilled to stop digging up their past and just focus on the right now safety and teaching the brain that we're actually okay and the body's okay and all the things we do in the uh, in my daily videos, as well as the group and the course and the weekly calls. So this Absolutely. Stuff, I'll let you the physical state too, I then had that key piece of evidence that said there is nothing wrong with my bladder, which was my, you know, my key kind of most, that's the area of my body that I, you know, TMS seemed to focus on for me. Sure. And that area of my body was perfect. So how could I be in so much pain if that area of my body was perfect? So it was that accurate knowledge that there is nothing wrong with my body and also, and it's kind of coming out now, is I don't have depression. I I have, I've been sad about things and I've been in despair about things. I'm not genetically like, I, you know, that I don't believe there is a genetic link in my success story to my father. My father just didn't have the tools that I have. Can I just share something? Um, my mother, her two brothers, and my mom's mom, so my grandmother, all had clinically diagnosed depression. Uh, one of my uncles killed himself from depression at 29 years old. And, you know, mental hospitals, therapy, medications, all that kind of stuff. And my mom said, it runs in the family, you know, it's genetic. And even to this day, 85 years old, she says, you know, her depression is genetic, genetic, genetic. And I'm like, no, maybe your dad was just an asshole. And your mom, your two brothers and you grew up with your dad. Maybe that's it. But then you got this label that said depression. And like you said, you know, I have things that I'm sad about. Depression, in my opinion, is deep sadness plus no hope of it changing. You get some hope. All of a sudden, depression just turns into sadness, which is still heavy. But you can drop the label. I yeah. mean, depression is not who you are. It's something we experience. Yeah. You know, lots of people have bouts of feeling hopeless and sad. It's an experience. It's not a label. It's not an identity. So I'm glad you've come to the conclusion that I don't have depression. I've been through a lot of stuff. Life's been lifey. Yeah, just a wee bit. <laughs> just, a, just a wee bit. Yeah. Um, That's my Scottish wee bit. Right, you say that right over there. I do, I do, yeah. I even in art, we say pity bit. So it's a pity bit, but wee bit. Um, is that bigger I, or smaller than a wee? <laughs> it's, it's, it's around the same as a wee. <laughs> nice. um, and I feel, you know, I, I feel so like my father that like you're saying there. Um, I mean, at the age of 21, my dad threw himself off a cliff. And you know, this is just as he'd met my mum. Not just as he met my mum. It was they they were together, but it wasn't. You know, he had mm -hmm. uh, he had such a lot. I mean, it's not the not the time or place, but a lot of crap went on in his growing up and got this label early on. Um, and but he had nowhere to turn, and there 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 isn't the same. You know, he had none of the tools or none of the information that we have. Um, so you know, he, he would reach points where he was. He just wanted out. Um, and that's why mum waited till well, she was 30 when she had Alison, um, which growing up in the Orkney Islands, you either went away off to university or did your careers or whatever, or you stayed on the islands, you got married young and you had kids. So, but my mum wanted to wait until, you know, my dad was more settled. Um, and I mean, he took a year to recover from the physical injuries of, right. you know, falling off a cliff. And I could remember growing up as well, you know, he... He had multiple suicide attempts. Thank the Lord he survived them. But the physical plus the pharmaceutical um, 
effects, side effects of what he was, he had to take early retirement at the age of 57, which destroyed him um, because he was such a social, you know, and so watching that, I wouldn't say a waste of a life because he had periods whereby life was good, but, you know, it was just that group, you know, what, if only he'd had TMS explained to him. So if we could bring it back around to your story. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm um, sorry. Just want to no, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right. I could sit here all day, all day and kind of reminisce. We're, we're having um, fun. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's big. And I am actually still on antidepressants because finding you, um, believing in TMS and TMS alone, having that accurate knowledge, building the mindset, I then felt confident to start coming off the medications that I was on. Right. But those medications were talking the codeine, lyrica, various things that I'd been on for months mm -hmm. and their addictive medications. I then had one hell of a journey coming off each and every one of them. Um so they meant that I that withdrawal process, I had to still hold on to that rock solid mindset and accurate knowledge and belief whilst I rode the wave of coming off those medications. So um, the last of them I came off about three months, four months ago. Wonderful. Um, but because I've been on the other stuff since the age of 25, then I'm giving my body a chance just to, you know, really enjoy being well and have, you know, I do have a rock solid mindset now. I do know I'm not in pain. Um, and if I do have kind of twinges and that I just think I look around and think what's my mental state am I relaxed what's my emotional state feel my emotions and everything I want to make sure and I'm not holding off and I'm not using this as an excuse but I just think in due course I'm going to slowly taper off that medication and that'll be me um but that's huge because I haven't done that since age 25 so I'm not I recognize it's been in my system for so long that I need to be really careful and do that when I'm, you know, and I've had uh, those that are in the group had a lot of things happen of late that have been lifey. So I want to make sure that not that life stops being lifey, but just it, just a little less lifey than it's been of late. Um, and I will look then to kind of come off the antidepressants. Yeah. So I'll remind anybody watching of uh, what Dr. Howard Schubner says about medications. He said, you know, it's okay to taper medications, but don't taper so long that it takes years yeah. because all that does is create extra fear. What you want to do is remind yourself and your brain that my body and brain will adjust to the lowering levels of medication and that I am safe and that I will, I will be perfectly fine. So you do want to taper in accordance to recommendations. But if somebody's telling you, all right, we're going to taper you over the next four years and you're going to go down in micrograms, you know, each taper, all that's doing is really just terrifying you that if you go too quick, it's going to be a problem. And in the medication world, um, medication withdrawal communities are very terrified. Yes. And I just had a conversation with somebody commenting on Facebook um, where they're now saying, you know, the medication withdrawal communities are defining that this is a benzo-induced neurological disorder, and they have a name for it, an acronym now. And Label. Okay, so it's a medical label, and I'm not suggesting that benzos or other medications cannot impact this. They no, can. They but when you combine being terrified of the medication process on top of perhaps legitimate withdrawal symptoms, those legitimate withdrawal symptoms get magnified. And mm -hmm. at that point, the mind body, the fear the perceived danger magnifies it and makes the entire withdrawal process worse. So again, not debating for anybody watching this, please don't come after me and say, Oh, you're, you're denying the medication withdrawal and how real it is. I didn't say that there are legitimate medication withdrawal issues. But fear is not your friend in that process. Being terrified of withdrawing and thinking I've got to, you know, go from 
80 milligrams to 79 and do that for six months before I can go to 75 and you're just terrifying yourself. And the story is if I go too quick, I'm going to be destroyed, but I don't believe the body takes that long to adjust. And the mind body aspect of withdrawal, I think is huge. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think when you were coming off of a lot of these meds, you had the benefit of the mindset work that you've been doing in the group and through, you know, a lot of my videos. Do you believe that helped you out through the medication yeah. withdrawal? Absolutely. And I think acceptance too. I mean, acceptance is key in recovery from TMS as well. Mm -hmm. And the acceptance that, you know, I'm I I was fine. Um this was something that I needed to come off. Clarity. But Clarity. I wasn't I wasn't afraid. Mm -hmm. And I at first, I started to look at lists of withdrawals when I first looked at, and I just stopped it. Um, because you know, as soon as I started to look at something, boom, my brain just latched onto it, and I'm like, "Whoa, you know, yeah. it's coming, it's coming." Which meant the other, you know, list that's this long, you know, my brain was thinking, "You're going to have this, and you're going to have this, yeah. and you're going to have this." I, and I, I think there's a definitely a the tendency for our scared, hypervigilant brains to pick up what I'll call sympathetic symptoms. So somebody just messaged me today and said, hearing the lady's story last night about blurred vision, she goes, my vision's blurry today. I said, the best approach is to say, it's like, it's contagious only through the suggestion that somebody else had it and the fear brought it up. And now you have a little bit of it. The best response is, isn't that fascinating? But my yeah. eyes are fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong. Give it as little fear, as little attention as possible. Move on with your day. Try not to freak out over it as best as you can. And just know that that's all that happened. The brain can be very suggestible, especially if you're still in a state of, uh, you know, chaos, hypervigilance, hypersensitivity. And, you know, if fear is still running the show, it's very easy for this scared, misinformed brain to latch on to. Um, new symptoms when we hear about them. So just wanted to bring that up. And that's why you were very smart not to read the withdrawal side effects list over and over and over again. And it sounds like you stayed away from the withdrawal communities online as well. I did. I never went on any of those. That's what I, was, I, call, bad, I... That's what I call bad neighborhoods. Stay away from the bad neighborhoods where all they do is talk about scary stuff. TMS, body, you know, I see medication withdrawals there's a lot of bad neighborhoods where all you're going to do is get more and more scared so i'm sorry what were you going to say well, i was going to say the same thing for the ic i was on those communities um uh for uh, you know a good number of months scary as heck um and yeah. i would not recommend them and and likewise buying the books that you know how to heal ic the ic diet um and basically it, it it's just a prescription for disaster um that's how i found it um and you just added another layer on well, to now now you're buying books and reading books about how to get rid of a medical condition called ic when in fact you've got a pristine bladder yeah exactly it means your brain's <laughs> creating it based on perceived danger and the presence of symptoms scares the brain and now we just automatically assume that if i drink the wrong thing if i eat the wrong thing if i don't go to the bathroom quickly enough, my bladder is going to expand, it's going to hurt, and then I'm going to set off a flare and, 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 right? And before you know it, it's all fear driven, it's all perceived danger. And as I talked about in the video I recorded today or posted today, the pain is real, the danger isn't. Yeah. Right. So I'm sorry. This is your story. No, I'm also going to say for, for, for people that, you know, I found that, you know, my, pain went in waves for sure um and it's just that um i never could say that the amount of pain that i was in was commensurate with how much of danger i was perceiving and i i stopped measuring my pain thinking oh it's really sore today that means i'm really perceiving huge amount of danger i'm like okay so what i'm not gonna stop what i'm doing i'm gonna keep going um and you know um, invariably it would, it would then kind of ease off um, and I'm not trivializing it by any means but what I had to, to teach myself to do was not to measure 
you know, it's really sore on it. You know, you know, when you go to the doctors and they give you, you know, that kind of range from one to 10, if you're a smiley face or a sad face or whatever to explain. Or a screaming that. face. Yeah, exactly. And my, then I, you know, first would kind of apply that to the pain. Um, and uh, and first, you know, as I was learning more about TMS, I started to think, right, okay, I'm on a five today. That means None of that, that tracking helps. No. No. And I think for a while I said to you, I feel like I'm 95% better, you know, and you would often say to me, no, you know, you, you, can, you, you don't measure percentages of being better. You're at, a, you know, at certain points in your journey, but it's not a percentage game. The end result success for me is no longer caring if I'm in pain or not and it not affecting my life. I had twinges of, you know, my feet, as I say, my face, this, this thing with me, but I've had symptoms off and on all day today. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? You're nervous because, about an interview. Yeah. And, and you can see I'm nervous because I'm reacting. Um, and I'm feeling that I'm coming out just with a jumble of information that doesn't make sense. But, you know. But it's, remember, remember what you taught me. Life can be lifey, but you don't have to hurt. Exactly. So hopefully that's what you're telling your twinges and your yeah. nervous subconscious brain that's going, uh-oh, uh-oh. And that's when you go, Shh, no, uh-oh. It's a phone conversation. It's a Zoom. Exactly. It's just Dan. <laughs> hey. <laughs> but no, I think that um, you use the expression um, or the analogy of learning to play a, a musical instrument or a new language. You are not going to get the phrase book or the chord book for the guitar um, and read two or three pages and the next day waking up and you can you know be on a, you know, a, an acoustic guitar solo or fluent in Spanish, for example, it's it's going to take time. And it's it took a very long time for my brain to be weaned off all that bad data, misinformation, previous medical diagnoses, um, shit that happened in my past. You know, it took me a long time to unravel all that, but I didn't do it through kind of like analyzing it um, or journaling about it or that. I just had, I accepted, I was aware of what was going on. I accepted TMS completely and utterly as the only thing that's going on. And I just applied the consistent message of safety. Yeah. Um, and so indifference for me took a long time. I could have some days where I was indifferent and I was getting on my day. The next day I was acutely aware of, you know, there's a twinge, there's pain, there's whatever going on. But on those days, I couldn't reach indifference. I didn't give up. I just kind of yeah. came that's, with the message of safety. Yeah. And so that's what I call calm reassurance. Because people hear me talk about indifference a lot. They're like, but I can't be indifferent. So I'm going to freak out instead. And that's not the only two choices. In the middle, there's the ability to give yourself messages of safety. Keep on living despite the pain. Do normal things as much as possible. Shift your attention away. If you're too terrified to shift your attention away, calmly reassure yourself. I'm going to be okay because I know with certainty what this is. You got the foundational knowledge that you can stand on that goes, yeah, this is an up and down journey and today's a tough day, but so what? I mean, I know exactly what's going on. We call it out for what it is. And our job is to teach this scared, misinformed brain that there's different data and information and we know it now. And so let's just not forget that and use that to calm ourselves down, calm the, and I don't even like talking about calm down the limbic system and the nervous system, because that's too much focus on, you know, the, the, the actual, you know, nerve impulses and everything else. I don't think your nervous system is damaged or broken or dysregulated. It's just turned up, the volume's louder. And it's operating on misinformation and fear. And with misinformation and fear, the nervous system is going to be very sensitive. It doesn't mean it's dysregulated. It doesn't mean it's broken and needs fixing or brain retraining to rewire it. I mean, just no. Your brain and nervous system is perfectly fine. Just operating on bad data. And, and I, I, I tried a bit of that, you know, what you're saying, with the retraining of the brain, that sort of thing. But again, I applied that kind of, kind of life principles that I've had um, and joined this course, did Vegas nerve retraining. You know, I had to make a conscious decision to move away from trying to be an expert in getting better from TMS. 
I just had to be a, keep a, accept that that's what was going on, being aware of it, consistent yeah. measures of safety, getting on with my life, fear and focus and attention and everything. You know, every time I kind of picked on something like the, the, you're saying, about the, 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 there could be this nervous system retraining. Fear and attention got me like into nitty gritty, three or four books about it, umpteen courses about it and everything. And before you know it, you're like, that's another thing to get worried about. That's another thing to get right. That's another thing. It's not working. Therefore, what am I doing wrong? It's just another thing to be perfect at. But that's assuming that the nervous system, the vagus nerve, the limbic system, that it's broken and I have to fix it. Yeah. Again, my premise is that nothing is broken. It's just operating with the wrong information. And when we correct the information, the brain takes care of it itself. So, and I'll, I often say in coaching calls, I'm like, throughout our lives, when did we ever have to focus on these systems? The limbic system, the amygdala, the nervous system, the brain rewiring. When did we ever have to think about that? Never. No. Focused on learning and picking up the guitar every day and practicing the chords and the scales and the soloing and all that stuff. My brain took care of the whole thing. The whole while, 57 years, just because I'm having pain now does not need, mean I need to retrain my brain. I need to give it better data, calm down the fear, and the brain takes care of the rest. Let's not overcomplicate this. But I found for me, and kind of the relevance of saying all that's you know, growing up and everything was, I was a special kind of broken in my head, you know, and I also had labels for that special kind of broken. So I'd been through an awful lot of shit, which wasn't nice. Um, but I then had this medical label on top of it of the depression from my dad's side. Mm -hmm. And then I had this IC. And, you know, to me, my brain would kind of say to me, but you're a special kind of broken. Yeah, this stuff makes sense. But you're a special kind. So, yeah, you need to kind of keep working on this fixing stuff. It Once I realized that we're all this, you know, our systems work perfectly. You know, what's happening is our brains are being fed with such misinformation, bad data, medical labels. And then on top of that, you're also then taught that, you know, you've got trauma. And what happened to me was traumatic. Of course. So then I'm in that kind of realm of, you know, trauma counselling and everything. And none of that, once I just basically took it all as a big kind of pile of, you know, shit, I kind of went, Bleh. and that's, that was that, that's, that's then, this is now. When I focused on the now and realised that I'm not broken, there's nothing to fix, just stay with the process, that accurate knowledge um, and your consistent measures of safety. And I keep saying that because that, for me, worked was keeping reminding myself of the basics mm -hmm. no matter what was going on around about me remind myself of the basics you know look myself in the mirror and say you're fine you're absolutely no matter what was screaming around in my body you're fine you're fine just keep going and just the shh and your 24 consistent measures of safety were up around you know various rooms in my house next to my mirror um Wonderful. and you know that I can't emphasize how much for me that's been key. It's just repetition, repetition, but not repetition. As I'm saying it, it sounds like it's like, oh, you've got to do this, repeat, repeat, repeat. It's not, it's just like, it's all going to be fine. Remind yourself continually. It's all going to be fine. Remind yourself continually. You're not broken. Just those gentle, just the way you speak to us in the mornings, just kind of, you put your own voice to that and just keep kind of washing yourself in that. And there isn't a point for me where I can say, aha, it's gone. My symptoms just over time slowly faded and faded and faded. But occasionally right, it would come back up. I think I shared on a call, we went off on a family holiday and um, uh, hiking and that. And I had a pain in my knee that came from nowhere when we were about to do this big hike. And I'm like, aha, no, we're going. And we're up this, you know, kind of mountain like this. Um, and I'm actually shouting at the my knee, telling it to do one. And literally, my pain jumped from one knee to the other knee. And I'm like, you are kidding me. Stop it. Are you, are you for real? Just buzz off. I didn't use buzz either. 
just go in. It's a different word. Yeah, and it kind of stayed in his one knee, and I just thought, you know what? I'm going down this hill even faster, Mr. Knee, because there's nothing wrong with me. Um, And we did that hike, and I was absolutely fine, and Nigel thought it was the most hilarious thing, me shouting at my knees and that. But I'd never had any bother with my knees. It's just like, what? And how about since have? then? No. You're fine? I'm fine. And so that's very instructive for anybody watching. If you get a new symptom, Ingrid's response was great. Clarity, certainty, there's not a damn thing wrong, which meant she didn't give it any fear. She didn't give it much attention. She kept on with her hike. She didn't get airlifted off the top of the mountain or anything <laughs> crazy like that. And over the subsequent period of time, there was no fear and there was no attention. Therefore, it never became persistent. Had you freaked out on the mountaintop, gotten you know, helicopter lifted down, you know, off the mountain, gone right to the hospital, they x-rayed it, MRI, whatever, and you just freaked out, got yourself a leg brace and were hobbling around, you could have potentially turned that into a long, long-term long thing. And that same holiday, I had IBS. And I'm like, I've never, what's this? Well, I, I had IBS. I had symptoms of IBS. Because my, like Nigel, my husband, has been diagnosed with IBS. Now, He's learned a lot about having breakfast with Dan. So he's had, but he not, he's he still has this kind of thing in his brain that he's got IBS. So he says, Oh, use my buscapan. I'm like, no, I'm not using buscapan. I said, there's nothing wrong with me. He says, Yeah, but you're complaining of stomach pain. I said, I'm not com- I, I I am mentioning that I happen to have a touch of stomach pain, but it's not stomach pain, it's TMS. Um, so that whole holiday, there was a lot. I always check in with myself, you know, mentally, physically, and emotionally when stuff is going on, you know, if I'm feeling twinges and that. Um, and I said, there was emotional stuff going on on that trip. Um, and I thought, oh, there you are, that's what it is. I'm, I'm, you know, my brain's just feeling a bit of danger. It's feeling a bit of perceived danger. It'll pass. It'll be fine. I don't need to run to the chemist. I don't need to pick up 111's the, the number we call here for the doctor. You know, I, I just said, no, it'll pass. If it takes two hours, it takes two hours. If it takes two days, it takes two days. If it takes a week, it takes however long it takes, but I'm going to be fine. So I'm not going to freak out. Keep out of the freak out zone or freak out less. Um, yes. And, you know, I, I think for me, I had to make that decision that I just, you know, this is all that's going on. And I know that's really hard to do, but it works. So it's like holding on to that. I, I remember you sometimes say, I know it's so accurate. Yeah. It's not that we're telling ourselves something, wishful thinking, false hope. It's accurate. It's what's actually going on. Now, we can convince ourselves that other things are happening. But if you can rely on the accurate information, if you've done the assessments that indicates TMS, perceived danger, pain, or other symptoms, then that's what it is. And the sooner you accept that that's the only thing going on, and I know you've said that a few times, it's the only thing going on. And let's set aside some of these doubts and fears. You're going to get better quicker. It's easier to dial down the fear when you have the accurate knowledge to, to stand upon. I think it's key too because those assessments that you have, um, the FIT and then the you know the, the, the assessments, yeah. When you look at them, and and that's the only explanation it can be because that's how your symptoms are behaving. Yes. There's no medical doctor's going to be able, they can try to make it, you know, because some of the doctors say, oh, well, that must be this. They're, they're guessing. Because I actually asked my psychiatrist, why was I put on so much medication? And because, you know, it was challenging to come off, but we've talked about that. But I wanted to know why, because none of it was needed. But he said, oh, well, we, you know, because of your range of symptoms, we were trying whatever we could. And I'm like, Okay, so knee pig. Yeah. And I think that can happen too. That they you can tie some of what is TMS and how your your symptoms are behaving as TMS through the assessments from the medical side. They can try and tie that down to these kind of like you know terminologies. But it's an actual fact, I wish to goodness they would learn from a medical school perspective about TMS, because then holy, they would they would save so much time and effort. And I mean, the pharmaceutical industry would suffer, but, you know, they, they it could be, money. yeah. And even as us in the educational system, just understanding how 
when I think back to how the emotional things that happened in my youth, um, if you had learned at an early age that these, you know, you can be in control of your own health and your body and your mind, then again, things that happen to you in your life, you don't need to, it, it wouldn't have that same effect because you very early on know the tools. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's been wonderful. And I have to say that joining the group was, the best, I mean, the best thing I've ever done. Um, I have, have found a family that you have unconditional love and support. You have zero judgment. You can be as vulnerable as you want to be. And as you know, Dan, I mean, I cry and, you know, crack jokes, and but you can be your authentic self. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, and invariably, even if you don't speak out about a question that you have, or you don't verbally don't put a question in, you'll find an answer through somebody else's question, sure. or you'll, you'll gain something that you were looking from somebody else's win, or the chat that goes on at the side, you know, during the, the call. Um, and I know I've got friends for life in, in the group. I know. Um, Myself, Annie, and Donna, and yourself. So hopefully, at some point, we're going to meet up and do a, a little dance in <laughs> New York City or whatever. I'm um, okay with that. Perfectly okay. <laughs> but no, and those, you know, you can. Um, it's really difficult to explain because I come from you know, I come uh, from the Orkney Islands, and then we live in a small. I come from knowing people inside out, but it's not on that same level. These are people that just get you that just really have got your back. Um, and that has been, you know, key. Another key in my in my recovery is just not, th with all those kind of like previous perfection and having to be the best and all, and that, I don't need that in the, in the pain for you environment. I don't need that in the coaching call, you know, although I apologize for my blushing and everything, but, you know, I- So you gotta stop doing that because nobody's noticing. <laughs> We might have thought you just put a little blush on, you know, makeup. <laughs> no, but um, I probably turned the heating up too high as well because it's actually freezing you. Um, but no, that, you know, I came onto those calls very kind of, oh, my goodness, I don't want to say anything. And, you know, now you can't shut me up. But it's it's a place whereby it's it's just so key in recovery for me. And for those that maybe are have joined the... the um, you know, your course um, and are hesitant about joining the group, do it. Even if you sit with the camera off at first, the, what you'll start to gain from it is invaluable. Um, but it's a community. I call it my pain for you family. Mm -hmm. And people on there have been so key in giving me confidence. And you do wobble. I still wobble. But you can go on there or you can, you know, hit up one of the girls, you know, out with and you you they 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 kind of like renew your confidence. They give you back your kind of you know, your TMS armor, if you like. Um one thing so I really love about the community is the amount of tears. And I know that sounds really crazy, but if somebody is scared, sad, frustrated, breaks down into tears. You look at the Zoom with like 20 people on the screen. Inevitably, there's like five to 10 people also getting choked up and crying with the person. There's that much empathy. And then when people are sharing happy stories, same thing happens. Everybody else is getting choked up. Like, oh, my God, I'm so happy for them. Look at that. They're wonderful. And that happens a lot. And to me, that's one of the most touching things. I've gotten choked up and shed some tears myself. And it's just so authentic. Yeah. Nobody's putting on a show. Everybody's showing up for themselves. Such a great group of people. And for the people who watch this and are, are saying, well, a group's not for me. A lot of people have felt that. Yeah. When they showed up and started engaging in the process and felt that level of support and compassion, they said, holy, holy crap. Holy crap. Holy crap. Like <laughs> they, they finally realized, like, what was I afraid of? Right. Were they afraid of judgment? Were they afraid of that sympathetic? If somebody tells a story about their sensations, maybe I'm going to catch it. 
And I talk a lot about resilience. Like, you know, people, somebody once sent me a message and says, can we ask people to stop using the word pain? Like it's a pain group. We're trying to get rid of pain. Like get some resilience. The word pain is not dangerous. If you're triggered by that, I understand it. We are gentle. We try to be gentle and use sensations or colorful sensations for extreme pain. And so just understand that we can decide the words are not dangerous and we don't have to be triggered by them. Why? Because we have the accurate knowledge that we can stand on that says, I'm actually okay. Consistent messages of safety, clarity, confidence, reminding ourselves of better data, less fear. You see how that can really take the sting out of a word called pain? That's think- word. It just says pain is the word. It's in the dictionary. Who cares? But pain to me has always been a word that's so wrapped up in fear. Of course. You know, the point on, is we got to get less fear of words yeah. and less fear of hearing other people's stories. And, you know, it's a process. So for anybody who's listening to this and says, oh, I'm scared of the group. I don't want to do it. I'm socially awkward. Like Ingrid was saying, leave your video camera off. There's plenty of people who will ask questions and just do the audio. Don't never get on camera. Um, so. In any event, what else would you like to share with uh, people watching? Well, I kind of, that's where I am now. It's just, it's, um, it's something that I think I said to you before we put the, the camera on. It's what you teach is simple in its essence. It's highly challenging to do, but my God, it's worth it. Yeah. Um, and stick it's with so much, it. It's so much easier than the other options. Running around yeah. medical doctors being, you know, traumatized by failures of treatments and medical labels being slapped on you every new doctor you go see, that's no easier because it's not working. And now you're even more terrified. Um, and I'll differentiate myself a little bit in the TMS community. There are a lot of different approaches, many of them heavily focused on the emotional discovery. Oh, and God, yeah. discovery is part of the equation. You heard Ingrid saying, you know, I check in what's going on emotionally, physically, mentally, remind myself I'm okay and don't buy into the fear, freak out less and all the, the things I teach every single day in the, in the free videos. So the emotions are part of it. But many of the TMS practitioners, the emotions are everything. And they spend little time talking about teaching the brain that you're okay. And they all talk about healing, which to me, that, that word I don't really use in my videos because healing insinuates you're sick or broken and something has to heal. So, you know, I'm a stickler for words, as you know. Using the right words and being super clear on what, what we're talking about is is really important. So. I love you, luck. It's the, you know, I always have it in my brain. Like, you know, you say TMS equals TMT. TMF and TME. Tell TMT, everybody what that means. So TMT, too much thinking. TMF, too much fear focus. TME, too much attention. That's going to give you too much shit. TMS. TMS. Too much shit. Too much shit. <laughs> so those things kind of kind of encapsulate what you teach. Um, and it, it's just, it's so freeing. After all that years, and as you just touched on there, that, you know, being able to set aside the emotional work and being able to set aside the fixing activities and being able to set aside the, this is so much work, was huge. Because it was just like, it's like the snow shovel. You just took the whole lot and you went, see ya. And for Um, people that say... I'm getting exhausted reminding myself that I'm okay all day. I said, all right, what's your alternative? Isn't it exhausting running around screaming that I'm broken, I'm fearful, I'm terrified, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm depressed? Is that any less difficult? That's the default. That's where a lot of us go to or have been. And what we're doing is we're just trying to flip this, flip the script. Flip the script. And so it doesn't take any extra time. To remind yourself that you're actually okay. No extra time. This is not four hours a day of homework that you've got to do and dedicate and block out and ignore your family. 
All this stuff is just as the day progresses, we just remind ourselves, as opposed to falling into the trap of the fear, focus, frustration, anger, depression, sadness, despair. No extra time required here. No. You know? And that's another one I didn't kind of touch on, but to me, there was a big was letting go of the storytelling. You know, all the things that have happened to me in the past um, that I've been told equal depression, equal, you know, blah, blah, blah. Letting go of that whole, st you can so easily get caught up in just that whole story you tell yourself. And oftentimes if you catch yourself, the things you're thinking, because your brain believes that which you think and say the most, what you're thinking and what's how it's playing out and how it's kind of like spiraling is only coming from you. You've gotten caught in your own story. Mm -hmm. When you can get move away from the story, Ted, and when you can say to yourself, shh, not yes. true, shh, it's all going to be fine. Stop the story. And rather than thinking, oh, my God, it's starting. I'm not going to be able to do this. And it's going to be terrible. It's flip that script. You know, if you if you kind of say, what if it all works out? What if this is going to be a great day? What if I go to this event that I'm like scared about and I have the time of my life? What if I walk into the room and, you know, people think, oh, there she is, big smile, rather than people thinking, oh, look at her. She's not pretty enough. She's not, you know, wearing the right clothes. She's not. Flip that script. And, you know, once you start to get into that habit, jings, the, um, the rewards are amazing. And you're right. And you get to yeah, and we have a choice. We have a choice. We can sit consumed by the all that we've spoken about. Or we can make a decision for ourselves that says, I'm going to give this a try. Let's see how much fun I can have today. Let's not pay attention to the, 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 you know, the level of pain that I'm in or the symptoms that I've got. Let's just, let's just give ourselves a five-minute walk. Let's just, you know, go out for a half an hour's drive. You know, don't set your sights on, I've got to go out there and I've got to walk for an hour, um, or I've got to do this you know, half an hour of, um, you know, don't set yourself huge goals. Just say, I'm going to, let's just give this a try. You know, we can always come back. We can always come home. And invariably, that for me made my confidence grow and grow and grow and grow. And as I said earlier, for me, success has been just being able to turn around and say, no matter what, I'm going to do this. Let's see how much fun I can have today. I still get occasional twinges. As I said earlier, there's a lot of lifey stuff going on in my life at the moment that I don't think, you know, it's going to be any value in sharing, but it's lifey shit. And yeah, I get twinges, but I don't get consumed. I just like, keep going. It's all going to be. So in this level of your journey, if you get a twinge, the reason you're able to allow it to fade away reasonably quick is because you're not buying in with the fear or the attention. Yeah. You call it out for exactly what it is. You check it emotionally, physically, mentally, remind yourself you're okay. There's nothing bad going on. And then you move on with your day. And invariably the brain goes, oh, look, she's fine. And things settle back down. Um, and that's exactly how it works. For anybody who's got some old symptoms showing up again, the less fear and attention you give it, the faster it's going to dissipate and the less intense it will be. If every time a new symptom shows up or an old symptom shows up, we freak out, we are making a decision to increase the, the intensity and the duration of that return or flare up of, exist, of existing pain. So. This has been wonderful. Unless you have anything else that you'd like to share with people no. watching. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you. And I, I think we will keep in touch for a really long time. I'm sure. I know. I don't, I don't see myself giving up the group anytime soon. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be like watching. Walking. You'll be like, holy cow, she's been in the group since last August. And, you know, people come for the information and the cure and they stay for the community and the family. That's a really good way of putting it. It's true. Right? Absolutely. We come Absolutely. for the cure, but we stay for the community and 
the family. And now I think you get just as much joy encouraging others in the group yeah, as you do support for yourself. Absolutely. And it's a great way to get just regular reminders. And so you don't have to show up every week. You don't have to stay for the whole, you know, there are three hour calls generally. You don't have to stay for the whole thing, pop in and out, but the replays are posted. Yeah. And there's actually like a hidden playlist on my YouTube channel. It's not available to the public just for the weekly co coaching calls. So you can go back. What's that now? Um, 15, 18 months from when these things started and see well over a hundred, you know, group coaching calls. And so, um, Anyway, really appreciate you, Ingrid. Absolutely. I appreciate you, Dan. I couldn't be, but I was. Absolutely a pleasure to know you. And, and I call you a friend. Um, somebody. Are you going to make me cry? <laughs> oh, I've got through it without crying, so. All right. Anyway. So, listen, I appreciate you. Thank you. You inspire a lot of people already in the group. And uh, I know a lot of people are going to want to watch this interview. So. Unless you got anything else, we'll wrap this up. Awesome. Thank you, Ingrid. My pleasure. Bye. <laughs>